Welcome to Praise, Prayer and Preaching with the Rev. Dr. Rick Dacey, Senior Minister, Wesley Congregational Life. This is my cousin, Barry. Barry's about the same age as me. He's a, a little different than me. He's, uh, he's a tall, lean tradie with strong, calloused hands from years of hard work on the tools. Barry's life has not always been an easy one. In fact, I think it's fair to say that Barry has had more than his share of struggle and suffering and pain. He's known his share, more than his share, of hardship. But that's his story to tell. It's not for me to tell that story. What I can tell you about, and what I really want to tell you about tonight, is something that I was privileged to witness this week. I had to witness it from a distance, a fair bit of a distance, because it happened in Florida. And I had to witness it over video, but even over video, it was a profoundly moving experience to witness it. It's something that, that had a huge impact on me, even over the course of all those kilometers. What I can tell you about is that last Sunday, on Easter Sunday, Barry was baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And I can't tell you how moved I was to watch that video. To, to see my cousin on the other side of the planet standing there waiting to be baptized. And, and those, those strong, calloused hands are trembling. Trembling not, not with fear, but with, with joy and hope. And, and, and he's, he's holding them, uh, partly, I think, in wonder, and partly uh, almost holding them the way that you, you, you might hold your wrists if somebody had just released a shackle that had been attached for years and years, and it was let go, and you're free. And you could see in his face this unrestrainable, uncontainable joy just flowing out of him. Last Sunday night here in Wesley Mission, we, we looked at uh, reaction shots to the resurrection. And this week, as I sat and I watched that video over and over, I could see a reaction shot to resurrection in Barry's baptism. It was so powerful to watch, knowing that it would have been a long, hard road down to the water. And the joy and awe in his face, they're an authentic, genuine reflection of what God has done, of what God is doing, and of what God has yet to do in his life and through his life. If you, if you were to witness Barry's baptism you might come away with the impression that that's the culmination, that that's the end of the story. That's the celebration at the end. That, that all struggle and pain and suffering in life are behind him now. And in Christ, he has died, he's risen to new life, hallelujah, happily ever after, end of story, close the book. But of course, baptism is not the end. It's only the very beginning. Only the very beginning of our new life in Christ. And right through the New Testament, we see that struggle and suffering and pain do not end with baptism. The Bible makes it clear, following in the way of Jesus Christ is not an escape 
from the cruelty and pain of this world. It's a journey that includes hardship and tears at times. It can be a road marked with suffering. And Peter, the Apostle Peter knew that. Oh, he knew that from personal, first-hand experience. He knew the road marked with suffering. Years before, he wrote this, this letter that we've, we've begun to read tonight. This letter of 1 Peter. He tried to convince Jesus to take an escape route around suffering. To steer clear of the suffering that awaited him in Jerusalem. Those of you who've been reading your Bible for a while, you remember Jesus' rebuke. Peter never would have forgotten Jesus' rebuke. Get behind me, Satan. And he would never forget that night when Jesus was taken away. And Peter was recognized by a servant girl. And he denied. He not only denied, he swore up and down that he had never met the man. He didn't know what she was talking about. He would not have forgotten that suffering. He would not have forgotten how he denied his Lord to avoid being lumped in with him. But you know, the, the one who is persecuted, you come alongside the one who is persecuted, you risk being persecuted too. And we see that in, we see that in school children. You know, who, look, at the, look at the child who is sitting on his own at the lunchtime, sitting on his own at the bench. Who is going to sit next to him? No one wants to sit next to him because the friend of the reviled risks becoming reviled too. And Peter, Peter knew what it was to not want to be lumped in with his Lord. Peter knew the road of suffering that Jesus chose. And now, years later, on the other side of the cross, on the other side of the empty tomb of resurrection, Peter finally gets what Jesus was saying when Jesus said, take up your cross and follow me. Now he gets it. And it's with that post-resurrection understanding, with that post-resurrection perspective, that he writes this letter, 1 Peter. This first letter of Peter is written to all of us. It's written to the whole church. And if you look at the addressees in the first verse, if you read the first verse of the first chapter and you see the address on the letter, it's a wide spectrum. It's not an individual or an individual church. That those places that are being written to cover a, a geographic area of about half a million kilometers, square kilometers. It's a huge area. The implication is that this is, a, this is a letter to all of us, but it's particularly a letter to people like Barry. To new Christians, to people who are coming for baptism or are newly baptized. Baptism is at the core of 1 Peter. So much so that, that some scholars have suggested that the letter as a whole is framed, crafted as a baptismal liturgy to be used uh, for Easter baptism. There are prayers and sermons to be used in the service. And, and those, the central theme of those baptismal prayers is interesting. It's suffering. Peter knows that these new Christians are they're going to encounter resistance. They're going to encounter ridicule. They're going to encounter rejection in living out their faith. And some of them are they may be reviled, they may be persecuted, and he wants them to be prepared, spiritually prepared for this. 
1 Peter is a letter of preparation. Peter wants these newly baptized, these new Christians to be prepared for what awaits them. And that is the key. Our baptism into Christ doesn't give us a pass on suffering. What it does is this. It puts suffering in a whole new frame. In Christ, first, our eyes are opened to the pain and struggle and hardship and suffering around us. And second, our eyes are opened to what God is up to in the midst of that pain and suffering and struggle and hardship. And third, our eyes are open to our part in God's response to the pain and hardship and suffering and struggle. We live in, in, the, in the now and the not yet, in the unfolding joy of receiving salvation. In, in, in his great mercy, Peter writes, in his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. That's the now. And here's the not yet. And into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. And then Peter acknowledges... That between the now and the not yet, there will be suffering. We will encounter suffering and struggle and hardship and pain. But then he goes on to point to what God is up to in the midst of the suffering. He uses a metaphor of a goldsmith refining gold. It's not an original metaphor that, that Peter is drawing out here. This is one that we see again and again in, script, in Scripture. We see it in Zechariah. We see it in Malachi. We see a, a, a version of it in Isaiah. In, in Proverbs 17.3, we read, The crucible is for silver, the furnace is for gold, but the Lord tests the heart. And here in 1 Peter 7, these have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith, of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. You know, we hear about the Lord testing. We hear about the proven genuineness of our faith. Is there anybody here who's thinking, oh, I don't want to be tested. Oh, we better get ready. We, uh, we, we better study. We don't want to fail the test. We want to pass the test. We don't want to be proven not genuine. We want to, to pass. We want to prove ourselves. Hmm. And if that's what we're thinking, then we are completely misunderstanding this metaphor. This is not God putting us to the test, trying to catch us up. This is not God, the taskmaster, looking to, to see where we've gone wrong, where we've fallen short. No, gold doesn't refine itself. Hmm? It doesn't happen by a force of gold's will. No, it happens by the goldsmith. The goldsmith is testing. And the key here is that it's not our work that God is testing. It's God's work that God is testing. It, it, gold is this precious thing. The goldsmith doesn't want to lose any of the gold. He just wants to take off the dross. Resurrection faith is a faith that has been tested in struggle and suffering. Faith that can sing praise in the face 
of suffering, in the face of struggle, in the face of persecution, in the face even of death. This is resurrection faith. History records that in the first centuries of the church, when dreadful plagues swept through the Roman Empire, the pagan elites, they abandoned the cities. They went off to their country estates. They hid out. They stayed away. And the healthcare system across the empire collapsed leaving the poor, the sick, the dying stranded in the cities, abandoned and forsaken, except for the communities of Christians. The Christians stayed. The Christians stayed in the cities. And they stayed to nurse the sick and to comfort the grieving, both believers and non-believers. The Christians stayed to care for them all. Their Christ-like compassion cost many their lives. Hmm. But they were prepared for that. They were prepared for that by leaders like Peter. They were prepared for that. They knew that their baptism was not an inoculation against suffering. Leaders like Peter had made that clear to them. And God was at work in and through them empower, and empowered them to bear hope and love in the midst of suffering, to stay with the suffering while others fled in fear. This is resurrection faith. And we see it in a young Christian named Perpetua, just 22 years old, and mother of a newborn infant. According to ancient accounts, Perpetua had been given every opportunity by the authorities to deny her faith in Jesus Christ. She refused. Her father was a very influential man. And he tried everything to persuade her to recant her faith. But Perpetua, she had a resurrection faith an unshakable resurrection faith. And together with the other members of her church, she was led into a Roman arena. And the crowd jeered. The crowd reviled as they were whipped Perpetua and her sisters and brothers in Christ were whipped by a line of gladiators. And when the gladiators departed and they left the arena, the wild beasts were released from their cages. And trembling with hope, the ancient account records that Perpetua led her brothers and sisters in Christ in singing a hymn. One of the beasts attacked and hurled her to the ground, and she was covered with blood. And she took her, her bloody robe and, and and covered an exposed thigh, and she, she groped around in the dirt for her hairpin to restore her disheveled hair. And all the while, she kept singing the hymn. Until at last, the Roman executioner approached Perpetua with a sword to finish her off. And her last recorded words before collapsing were aimed at her Christian companions. She said, stand fast in the faith and love you all one another. And do not let our sufferings be a stumbling block to you. This is the faith that Peter wants to see in these young Christians. This is the faith that Peter wants to see grow and mature in my cousin Barry. This is resurrection faith. 
This is the faith that Jesus calls out in you and in me. Not that we would go chasing after persecution, no. Not that we would glorify suffering, no. But that we would be prepared to see God at work in the very midst of it. Jesus says, Blessed are you when people revile you, when you are persecuted because of me. We, we, uh, we Christians don't know persecution here in Sydney. I, I don't know if that's news to any of you. We don't know persecution here in Sydney or where I'm from in America. We don't know persecution. I hear uh, Australian and American Christians sometimes talk as if the church here is persecuted or the church in America is persecuted. It's not persecuted. They talk about the, the church being persecuted because of the changes going on in society and because the church no longer holds the central place that it once did in Western society. Because our numbers have diminished, because our, our resources have diminished, because our cultural clout has diminished. They talk about persecution of the church in contemporary Western society. But look, that is just rubbish. We don't know anything about persecution here. There are people in our Wesley Mission family who come from parts of the world where, where, where you know persecution. Some of you would have experienced that firsthand. Some of you would have experienced what it means to have family turn their back on you, cut you off, because of your faith. You know. You know what it is to be reviled. But let's be clear. The loss of the church's privileged place in Western society is not persecution. And the fact that Starbucks decided not to put Merry Christmas on their coffee cups last year is not persecution. It's not. So what does it mean for us here in Australia where, where we're free to worship as we like, when we like, as we like, where, where the biggest threat to the Christian church is not antipathy but apathy? What does it mean? Where is our blessing in this? Where is our calling? Living a resurrection faith is not about us developing as a church, developing a persecution complex. It's not about us trying to make ourselves out to be the aggrieved victims. Jesus doesn't call us to seek out persecution. He calls us to seek out the persecuted and to come alongside them to share their common lot as he did. I think of our sisters and brothers in Pakistan where the Christian community is crying out in anguish tonight. Families, many of them women with their children, playing in the park on Easter Sunday. And tonight, more than 70 are dead. Both the Christian targets and their Muslim friends and neighbors gathered together in the park. 30 of them, young children, blown apart by a hate-fueled suicide attack. And yet, and yet tonight, on the second Sunday of Easter, the Christian community, the Christian community in Pakistan continues to stand not cowering in fear or, or raising fists of vengeance, but to stand bearing hope-fueled witness to the power of resurrection faith. And sisters and brothers, it is our calling to stand with them, to come alongside them through our church partners with prayer, with practical support, to hold the Christ light up with them, and not just with them, not only with them, 
But around us in our daily lives, this is our calling. Who are the people around you who are reviled? Who are the people around you who are suffering and struggling? You know what's going on inside you. Who are you called to reach? Who are the outcasts around you? Jesus came for them. Are you willing to be lumped in with these people? Jesus was willing. Jesus was willing. He came alongside the lepers and the outcasts. He came alongside the prostitutes and the foreigners and the, the tax collectors and the sinners. He was reviled for it. He came alongside the bruised and the broken, and he said, blessed are you when you are reviled and persecuted, not when you play the victim because of your faith, but when your faith puts you in places where, where you risk being tarred with the rest of them, where you risk being lumped in with the rest of them. Blessed are you when you take your place with them. When Jesus rode into Jerusalem, he knew that he wasn't his riding in to take his place among the, the rulers and the elites. He knew that he wasn't riding in to take his place among the respected and the respectable. He knew that he was riding into Jerusalem to take his place among the reviled and the persecuted, among the outcasts and the suffering. He was riding in to take his place among the transgressors. And to be numbered with them. To be numbered with us. Now, I thank God that, that as Wesley Mission, we stand every day with thousands who are struggling and suffering. We stand with them not because we're especially righteous or holy people. No. We stand with them because... We are receiving our salvation. And in response to that, we want to declare that, that we want to stand where Christ stands. And sisters and brothers, may we reflect this resurrection faith in our everyday lives by his grace and in his strength.